Let's talk a little oil and gas. Let's talk oil and gas because it is a topic. By the way, did you see the inflation numbers that just came out this morning? 7.9% that they're telling us, which is the highest in decades, 7.9%. Uh, uh, gas prices, record-breaking. Guy sent me pick Yesterday I was talking about gas, uh, the price of it. Everybody's sending me a message with what gas prices are in different places. Beverly Hills, 7-Eleven. Mm. For for a oh ten, my God. seven seven eleven seven eleven in Beverly Hills, Glendale was like six seventy nine to fill up one gallon is six seventy nine. Uh, what was that? Go back to it. Seven point nine percent forty year uh, uh, record that we yeah, have. I saw it on your Instagram. Yeah. So so here's Russia with oil. Russia with oil. Okay. I'm going to read two stories back to back, and then we'll comment on it because it's uh, uh, both uh, around the same thing. One is an insider story, and the other one is a CNBC story. So here we go. Uh, number one, OPEC chief says there's no capacity in the world that could replace Russia's 7 million barrels a day in supply. This is an insider story. Mm -hmm. Russian oil exports are crucial to global supply, and there's no sources that can compensate for the millions of barrels the country contributes, OPEC Secretary General has said. So far, OPEC and its allies, known as OPEC Plus, have shown no interest in ramping up production, leading some analysts to say that this is... Contributing to the squeeze on supply, the threat on an, oil, on an import ban prompted Russia's deputy minister to issue a warning and predicts oil prices could surge to, ready folks, $300 a barrel. And the story right afterwards, CNBC, Russia warns $300 a, a barrel. It is absolutely clear that a rejection of Russian oil would lead to catastrophic consequences for the global market, Russian Deputy Prime Minister Alexander Novak said on Monday. Let me read this one more time to you. This is a power play. I'm going to read it to you one more time, folks. Listen up. This is the Russian Deputy Prime Minister Alexander Novak said on Monday, okay? It is absolutely clear that a rejection of Russian oil would lead to catastrophic consequences for the global market. The surge in prices would be unpredictable. It would be $300 per barrel, if not more. Russia is the third largest oil producer behind U.S., Saudi Arabia. U.S. doesn't count because we're not doing anything. Saudi Arabia didn't re uh, return uh, uh, Biden's call when they reached out to him. They just didn't even call him back. And the European Union uh, received around 40% of its gas via Russian pipelines, several of which run through Ukraine. Once again, EU, 40% is through Russia. So thoughts on what's going on with gas prices? Have you seen those stickers that have been popping up all over the country on gas tanks? It's like a little silhouette of Biden pointing to the price that says, I did this. I think that's exactly correct. This is not Russia's fault. This is Biden's fault. This is Biden's fault because he could have prevented what's happening between Russia and Ukraine. This, this, is, this is not something that just arbitrarily happened. This is, this is a result. The war that's happening between Russia and Ukraine right now is a result of deliberate actions taken by Joe Biden. And what I mean by that is just a couple of months ago, if he had stopped the key or if he had stopped the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, if he mm -hmm. had put sanctions like Trump did on that pipeline, then Russia would have backed off. Biden personally lobbied Democratic senators not to reimpose those sanctions. So what happens? Obviously, then Putin is emboldened because he knows that there are countries like Germany who rely on him for energy, meaning they're not going to criticize him when he commits a war act against the Ukrainians, right? But it, it goes even deeper than that. It goes deeper than that because Russian money has been funding the environmentalist agenda in our country for years. And this is not, this is not like exclusive journalism that I'm presenting to you. This is actually something we have known about. And when I say we, I mean our government officials. Back in 2017, there were two Republican congressmen. This story is so fascinating to me. There were two Republican congressmen, Smith and Weber, who sent a letter to Secretary of the Treasury Mnuchin saying, listen, we have evidence that Russian state money is going through a shell company in Bermuda. The shell company is called Klein Limited. And Klein Limited is then giving, as anonymous donations to um, a 501c3 here in the United States, giving this money to an organization called Sea Change. Sea Change is then disseminating this money to prominent anti-fracking, anti-fossil fuel, so-called green organizations here in our country. And the purpose of this is like Vladimir Putin has been planning this attack on Ukraine for a long time. This has been a long time in the preparation because this has worked. This lobbying has worked. It has caused states across our country to ban fracking. It's caused Biden to take his stance against fracking, against using our natural resources, against the federal leases. And the result of this has been, well, of course, when we turn to wind or solar or anything alternative or renewable, it, we still rely on coal. We still rely on oil, right? 
even even with this green energy. But when we need to rely on oil and we're not producing it ourselves, we have to rely on Russian oil. And that gives that gives a position of leverage to Vladimir Putin. He knows no then question about it. that he yeah. can mm -hmm. he can invade Ukraine and that nobody can really do anything about it because they rely on him. And so when I see, I know this is a long answer to your short question of please rant about the gas prices, but this is not something that just arbitrarily happened. This is not something that happened overnight. Mm -hmm. This is the result of deliberate, bad, corrupt choices by our politicians for a long time, for a long time. Did you see what uh, John Bolton had to say about this What's situation? That? You know who John Bolton is, right? Yeah. The National Security Advisor. The most famous mustache. Yeah, the mustache. Industry. Yeah, the walrus yeah. man who was Trump's National Security Advisor. Yeah. Now, you might say they've had a falling out, but he's certainly a Republican. He's certainly part of that community, for sure. He said, quote, unquote, um, that they were asked, why did, this is his thoughts, not mine, why did Putin delay this invasion of Ukraine. He said, quote unquote, Putin delayed the invasion of Ukraine because Putin saw what Trump was doing, was doing a lot of his dirty work for him, that Trump was basically being um, hostile towards NATO. And he basically thought that uh, if he won a second term, there was a chance that Trump would pull out of NATO. So Putin was basically just biding his time, you know, play on words right there, biding his time to see if Trump would actually pull out of NATO. Now, whether he was going to do that or not, there was no doubt that he was hostile to, towards NATO, and this is sort of separate from the gas prices, but this is a direct answer to why Putin chose this time. But this was John Bolton's opinion. Do you have any strong feelings on what John Bolton has to say or what he well, stands John for? Well, John Bolton and Donald Trump are on opposite ends of the Republican Party. And what I mean by that is there's a, di there's a division, mm -hmm. especially when it comes to foreign policy. There's interventionists like John Bolton or like He's Marco certainly Rubin. not a dove. He's a definitely war No, hawk. no, he, he wants, he wants to, to bomb to Iran. attack Iran, for yeah, sure, yeah. 100%. I mean, he would admit this. This isn't, yeah, this well, isn't even a He said it on camera. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Is, yeah. And then Donald Trump was very much national interest. He called it America first. It's really a Reagan foreign mm -hmm. policy, but he didn't want to get involved anywhere unless he has to unless it's in our direct national interest it's, it's actually closer to the isolationist end of the mm -hmm. spectrum um i think i think john bolton actually misses misses the point here i don't think that trump was hostile to nato i think that that was a negotiation tactic to get nato members to pay their fair share the u.s has been paying the majority of dues to nato for a long time and all of these other countries have been freeloaders they've been taking advantage of us as they they have enough money they've just been using it for their own domestic welfare systems and just yeah. allowing the u.s to do it because we would to pay this amount because we would and so trump is calling them out he's forcing them he's threatening them mm -hmm. as a negotiation tactic and sure he probably meant it all good negotiation like when you when you make a threat like that you have to follow through or it's not a real threat people can sense that um but I don't think that he ever had any real intention of pulling out of NATO. I think that he was just using this to get people to pay, and it worked. They did pay. Well, John, you, you expect John to say anything about Trump? You expect Bolton to say anything good about Trump right now? You know, you he was his up? national security advisor. No, no, no they had a huge falling out. You remember exactly. his book. But, 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 but that, but that's, same thing with Bill Barr now, same thing with yeah. Pence now. Yeah. He mm -hmm. has these people that are sycophants to him. And then next thing you know, they're out and they talk mm -hmm. shit about him. It sure. just seems to be a common theme is all I'm saying. Right. But you step back to where this topic started, which was on you know international oil prices. There is a Cold War that's been going on for the last 25 years, and it's on the price of oil. It is a Cold War that's going on between Saudis and the U.S., between Saudis and Venezuela, between the cheaters that are in OPEC that are shipping and not telling the other OPEC people. Remember, it was the Saudis that wanted to cripple Alberta oil sands and North Dakota oil sand and shale oil by keeping the price of a barrel at $45. They, they acted against their own um, total profit and pulled the price all the way down there. Now, why'd they do that? Well, they do that because, you know, uh, Alberta and North Dakota were not economically feasible oil extraction below $50 a barrel. Now, with the price per barrel up, this is the exact time where Biden can flip the switch on energy independence. Where does Canada get 100% of its natural gas? Us, the United States. Now you could sit back and say, you know what? Let's loosen up on this. Let's loosen up on it. And Saki yesterday, that was a terribly disingenuous answer that she gave on this whole energy question. Well, they've, they've, you know, they have the leases. Leases is not a permit. A permit takes forever in Washington. A lease is, is that you have a right to drill once you get a permit to drill. But the permits live in Washington and they, the green drag feet on that. So when you look around on the oil stuff, Pat, this has been going back and forth for a while. And, and Putin's three-step process here also was benefiting the price and the need for the Russian oil. But we got to 
also realize why those Saudis didn't return Joe Biden's phone call. Oh, by the way, I'm going to read this. they've been playing with us for yeah. a while I mean, as well. I'm laughing, but it's not funny. It's really. not funny. So if you enjoyed this little segment from the podcast, click over here to watch the entire podcast. And if you've not subscribed to the channel, please do so. Take care, everybody.